Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first workshop of our third annual Black Family Homeschool Educators and Scholars Virtual Teach-In. Today, you have joined us for the first session of the day, the first live session, creating a cultural-centered and nature-based cooperative featuring speaker Alicia Wright. Let's learn a little bit about Alicia Wright. She is a former public educator turned homeschooling mother, currently homeschooling three daughters with another one in a specialty high school. Alicia runs a homeschool cooperative for children of color in Virginia. She places emphasis on the importance of using a culturally relevant pedagogy and creating diverse homeschool communities and experiences. She's the director of radical inclusion with Together We Will USA, founder and director of Cultural Roots Homeschool Cooperative, director of Inspired Learning RVA, and an African-American studies teacher through C online classes and out school. Alicia was speaker was a speaker last year in our second annual Black Family Homeschool Educators and Scholars virtual teach-in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Welcome, hello, Black people. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in, where on the earth you are. Good evening if you're on the other side. I am so excited to be here and so excited that you all wanted to join me today to learn a little bit more about possibly creating spaces in your own community. Um, I really like to talk about uh, creating homeschool cooperatives, um, which is a huge term, right? a cooperative. It looks a number of ways. We're going to talk about some of the ways in which they look. Um, and I am a huge fan of helping others create them as well. And so I am happy to direct this conversation to whatever, whatever ways um, best meets the needs of you. And so if you have questions, do please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I will stop periodically to answer them. I will answer them again at the end. Um, yeah, so I don't mind at all. All right. so. Again, a little bit about me. I'm located here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, those of you who know, <laughs> you know, Richmond uh, formerly was the capital of the Confederacy. It can be a quite oppressive place in which to live. <laughs> and so once I left my public school education journey and became a uh, homeschooler, it was quite difficult to find a space for my children. I have currently, uh, their ages are, I have an 18 year old who's in college. Um, I have a 14 year old, a 12 year old and an eight year old. And so at this point in my life, I actually have one child in each of the major levels, elementary, middle, high school and college. <laughs> and for the majority of them, everyone but the 18 year old, they've been homeschooled their entire lives. Um, so I taught in the public school system for about 12 years um, before leaving and deciding to home educate my own children. And so again, um, that's a little bit about my journey and how I'm here. We hopefully will have another person joining us today. Some of you may know Amber O'Neill of Heritage Mom, um, author of many books, author of curriculum. She has a beautiful space uh, where she's located uh, and hopefully she will be able to jump on and join me in this conversation, which I think will just make it even more enriching. Hello, yeah, shout out where you are. Like I said, I'm here in VA, so feel free to jump in the chats and let us know what state you're um, coming in from. Also, Dr. Khadija has uh, warned to play. Ah, oh, here comes, I see Heritage Homeschoolers. So we'll get her in here and get her pinned with me. Uh, just so you know, before we start, all of my social media links are on here with regards to co-op. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my personal one on here. You can find me as well on Instagram at uh, Homeschool Life in, in VA. <laughs> That's me on homeschool. I'm sorry, that's me on, on Instagram. All right, welcome, Amber. Thank you so much. Hello, great to be here with you. Yes, I'm super excited. And um, maybe Dr. Kendrick can probably pin us both. I think I might be able to do that too. I think I might be able to allow a multi pin she's, here. She's pinned. Oh, okay. I know sometimes you can have the same two faces uh, side by side. Um, you might want to change your view because she's pinned. If if you go um, speaker view, you might see the both of you. Ah, okay, beautiful. Thank you so much for letting me know that. <laughs> and I will go to speaker view. Okay. 
um, I didn't, so Dr. Tanisha, did you have an introduction for Amber as well? Or Amber, you're welcome to also introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Amber O'Neill Johnston, often known online as Heritage Mom. So I blog at heritagemom.com and you can find me on Instagram at heritagemomblog. And I typically share about the need for inclusive, diverse, culturally rich um, books and resources. And I run a group called Heritage Homeschoolers um, in Cobb County, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And we are about to head into our sixth school year uh, for the group. And um, my children, I have four children. They are about to be seven, nine, 11, and 13. And I've homeschooled them from the beginning. Beautiful. All right, so I think since this uh, talk today is uh, largely on how to create a homeschool cooperative, maybe we can both tell our stories about how we got to the point where we decided we wanted to uh, create community and what those first steps look like. Um, uh, in a polite manner, I will let you go first. <laughs> For me, um, I actually never desired to start a group. I, um, had, I tried to find other groups in my area and I joined several of them and they were nice and great. And I thought kind of everything was okay. We can do some field trips with them and take some classes. Um, and for me, what happened is that my oldest daughter, Nina, she started exhibiting some really disturbing signs. It's almost like textbook off of something like um, that you would see online when you think about um, just black children who have an issue with accepting who they are. So she would talk about her hair and not liking her hair being curly or braided or any of the styles that I put it in. She would speak disparagingly about her skin and just about being black in general. I found this to be extraordinarily disturbing as you can imagine. And I really couldn't point a finger to it. Uh, in so many cases, I, uh, people can like blame the school or other people that their kids are around. But in her case, she had only ever been at home with us. Um, and so I started thinking that um, we had to do something drastic and desperate. And as I started really making sure that she was in, in front of more Black people, I saw this little kid light up. It was like a wilted flower and she became in fresh bloom. And I was like, how can I get more of that? And I know we spent a lot of time in our homeschooling community and environment. And I honestly felt that having a black community for her was like a medication, like something that she actually had to have for her emotional, mental, and physical health. And because I know at Atlanta, people think, oh, there are black homeschool groups everywhere. But as I mentioned, we live outside of Atlanta, Northwest in a different county, and we wanted local, hyper-local community and couldn't find it. And so that is what led me to start Heritage Homeschoolers. And I was telling, you know, my husband and I got together and we said, we'll look for five Black families, five people who want to do life with us. And now our group, this past school year, the school year we're just wrapping up, we had 105 member families. Um, covering 260 kids. So it wasn't just my kid that was struggling. Um, all of us have a similar story. So that's how our group started. Beautiful. And you know, I right before you popped in, I was right about to share a, a very similar story where when we started homeschooling, um, I was I left the classroom and I thought this is gonna be easy. You know, I've, I've got a master's degree in education. Like I'm thinking I know everything. And life in a classroom is not the same as life at home right because i got grandma i need to go to her doctor's appointment i got people knocking on the door i got life right um it just doesn't work the be a bell doesn't ring and we automatically shift um uh, and so we said all right let's find some community there's a little co-op down the street you know um it was religious we are super religious people but we're like it's right down the street we're just gonna go get what we need and we tried that for about a year and what i found myself doing was um Sort of becoming a shadow of myself you know what i mean like it, they, most of them were not black we had it was a few families but a lot of them were families who were um transracial so they may have been white parents who had black children right they may have been african right who had come who had migrated here so they so although they're black obviously right they didn't have the exact same cultural experiences and a lot of them were heavily deeply um, involved in uh, the same churches as a lot of the white folks um, and so I would be listening to conversations thinking, oh my God, what, <laughs> what did I just hear them say? And my children would be like, 
they said they voted for this person. I'd be like, what? You know? <laughs> and they're doing this and they're doing that. Um, and so we just had a lot of differences. And I found myself, like I said, you know, sort of walking around tiptoeing, sort of not being true to who I was. And I, and I remember one day thinking, if I'm doing this as an adult, if I'm feeling this way for this three hours that I'm here, I know my children are feeling the same way, right? They can't fully express themselves. And one day my daughter wore a black girl's rock shirt and the comment was, well, don't, you know, this all, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, you know what, it's time to just keep stuff out. And so I knew a few homeschooling moms. Um, we scoured the Facebook, sending uh, probably, um, uh, you know, crazy sounding messages <laughs> to other melanated people. <laughs> yes. Like, hey, I'm not trying to stalk you. Um, I just see you live around this way. You also are homeschooling. We're trying to find community. You want to get together. Um, and eventually it developed into um, a community. And so I was able to find some images um, even that I'm gonna kind of sh that I'm gonna share. So this was um, our first meeting, and you see, it is a rather diverse group, right? Um, yeah. What I will say is that all of the children that belong to these folks are all children of color. Yes. Um, and that was what my emphasis was: finding families and with children of color, because that's what I needed for myself. I needed to be around Black women, um, and I needed my children around um, Black and Brown children. Um, and so this was our first meeting when we first um, came together to try to create uh, a space for us. But it was the same thing. It was their communities out there, but we didn't necessarily, we felt tolerated, but we didn't feel celebrated. And there's a big difference when you learn that, right? Yes. When you experience being somewhere where you are celebrated for your Black Girls Rock shirt versus people like, okay, but all girls rock, you know? <laughs> No, that is so true. I have found that to be so true. And, and, you know, it's one thing I think sometimes at, when my, my kids were little, when that, when a lot of this started and I had fooled myself into thinking they couldn't feel those little things, those little slights, um, the little microaggressions, the little kind of tolerant things or rolling of the eyes or weird looks. I really felt like the, I understood those things, but they wouldn't. And apparently I was wrong. I think that these are young people. They're people from day one and they feel that same ice that we feel. They may not be able to articulate it, but it showed out, you know, in my, in my daughter's behavior and what she could articulate. And instead of telling me, mommy, somebody said this today, or mommy, somebody said that it manifested. And I don't like myself. There's mm -hmm. something wrong with me. Um, and so I think what you're saying is so true. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I know that's, that's gotta be hard, right? Cause then you have to go back and redo all of that damage and rebuild up all of that that self-confidence and self-love and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then as a parent, I know I felt a lot of guilt to like, why did I even subject myself to this space? Like, why did I even subject my children to this space? Well, it's because you're desperate for community. And when you don't know, you know, you don't know. You walk into these spaces hoping that people are decent human beings. <laughs> and then you find out that sometimes all of the other little things that make us who we are, you know, may be fine for some, but are deeply impactful for others, right? Yeah, I think it's that it's you don't know, and and also there, I I I never imagined that I would be the one to start a group. So I kind of also felt I didn't have any options. You know, it was just like I, I thought this might not be the best environment for us, but where else are we going to go? Who else are we going to do things with? And I even joined a group that was like over an hour away, and it was fantastic. I mean, I just, I cried at the first meeting. I'm sure they thought I was completely nuts, but I just being in the room with these black women and their kids, I couldn't, I was overwhelmed with emotion. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, it was very difficult because, uh, you know, they would have like a park play date or something. And I, I would get there, I would drive like an hour and a half. And then after like an hour, they'd be like, all right, well, we'll see you guys later. I'm like, nah, girl, you gonna stay at this park all day. Okay. Cause I just drove an hour and a half. And so I realized that, you know, it, it's better than nothing, but I really needed someone right in our area because mm -hmm. I wanted more than just a weekly, um, kind of, coming together. I wanted to see these people frequently and I wanted to do life with them in, in, the, in some ways, you know? And so it came down to, you know, this idea of starting a group, which felt terrifying at the time. It, it is. 
So I thought this would be a great transition into this slide here, which is, well, what is a homeschool cooperative? The first thing I'm going to say is that it is pretty much whatever you decide to make it. It is, it, it looks a number of ways. People have, since COVID, you know, started using all different sorts of words. I think if you, between 2020 and now, the word pod seems seem to have been like the niche word, right? Creating a pod, um, you know, micro school, which are a little, which can be a little bit different, right? But Cooperatives are basically just a group of people who are getting together on a regular basis, right, to achieve some sort of common goal. And you determine what that is. Um, there's a mama who reached out who lives about an hour away from me, who I'm hoping joins our space, but I understand because that same thing about being an hour away, right? Like, I know because I'm in Richmond and I was, you know, before I created my own, I was tempted with the idea of driving two hours about an hour and a half to DC to join uh, some of you may know Sankofa Homeschool yeah. Collective, which is beautiful, right? You watch yes. this and I'm literally drooling at the mouth like I want this so badly. And then I'm thinking, y'all know DC traffic? <laughs> <laughs> but that's where I was. I wanted it so badly that I was like, I'm going to drive every Friday. You know, that's probably a minimum of about four and a half hours total in the car that we would have to, you know, do. Um, and it just, realistically wasn't feasible. So, you know, these co-ops, when you're thinking about starting a co-op or some sort of collective, um, the biggest thing I, I suggest to people is to think about what it is you need for your family, because we all have different needs. Perhaps your most urgent need really is, I don't like teaching math. My child doesn't enjoy me teaching them math, but they do much better with, with friends. So maybe I can find, you know, two three other people and we're going to get together and we're going to get this math done and we're going to plan and create fun math games and, and all those sort of things and maybe that's what you need and then there's of course some social component there um perhaps what you really want are field trips you say well we're free on thursdays um we just want to have like a, a crew to get together and be like let's go to the science museum let's go to the park let's go you know venturing up to the smithsonian um and that's really what your the extent of what your family needs. Perhaps you want community service, right? Or perhaps there's a social issue that you are concerned about, the children are concerned about, or a project that they want to take on. And so all of these things are things to think about when you first begin uh, creating a group. Like what is, um, you know, I, I say selfishly, but what is it that you need if you're the one who's creating it? <laughs> Um, and it's much better to start from that. Not necessarily what everyone else needs, but what is it that you need for yourself? What is it that you know you get this, you're going to be happy about it? Because running a co-op is a lot of work. Um, and if you're not enthusiastic or passionate about what's being offered, then you can get burned out pretty quickly because that passion is what keeps you going. It's not big dollars. <laughs> At least not for me. <laughs> no, I agree with that. And I, yeah, having your families, having your family's needs met is critical. And I think um, looking for what your family needs today, as well as kind of with an eye towards tomorrow, like I knew that I didn't want our group to only have little kids because I was like every year my kids are getting older and older mm -hmm. and I wanted to have a thriving middle school and teen environment as well. Um, so just, yeah, making sure that your family's needs are being met because it is sacrifice, it's sacrificial, and your family sacrifices as well from your time in the evenings or preparation and all that. So they understand the language when they're also getting great gifts from it, um, then they understand that, you know, when you have to step away to help manage it. Yeah. I'm going to read off a list of some things that I wrote down. Um, things to think about before you get started building a co-op. And then Amber, I would love for you to maybe find one of these things or something that I didn't mention and, tell, and maybe talk a little bit about it, like which one you find, uh, maybe your top two or top three. Um, like I've already said, figuring out your purpose, right? What is it that you need and that you want? Thinking about parental involvement, right? Because it's not just you, you're now interacting with other humans, right? And other adults. And so, um, you have to think about, people are going to say, what do you need me to do? What do you want me to do? And you probably think a little before you start, what it is you're going to need people to do realistically and try not to do it all yourself. That's something that I'm currently still working on, but I've gotten better over the years. <laughs> Micromanaging a little bit. Um, logistics. Okay, we're going to get together. I've got some people. Um, where are we meeting? 
when are we meeting? Is this standing? Is it changing? Is it just on a whim? Um, you might want some structure around that, uh, especially if you're going to meet, you know, if you're going to meet at someone's house, um, and initially that may say, oh, that's a great deal. We'll just meet at my house this week and your house one week. Um, there's a lot with that as well, right? Um, with, okay, now I've got to clean my house, which may not be a big deal, but I've got to clean my house, like company level clean my house. <laughs> Right. Or now I've got kids tracking through my house. It's muddy outside. Now I've got like mud tracks or, you know, somebody put too much stuff in the toilet. And now I'm like, OK, I got to fix this. And now people want snacks and drinks. So now I got to go in my refrigerator. So I mean, there is, you know, I've got a baby upstairs. You know, it's nap time. People want to hang out and chit chat. And I'm like, OK, co-op is over. <laughs> so thinking about those things and putting some uh, structures in place, size and values. Right. What? are your values this is probably uh, for me one of the biggest um, ones right because we all come from different backgrounds and we all have different values but when your values don't align and you're meshed with someone for a year it can be really hard right if you have a, a, a main disagreement in your core ethics or values and so thinking about that what is it that you want um, and I think a lot when I come to that about parenting styles, right? Um, you know, how people intentionally parent or not intentionally parent <laughs> and how that might impact your child as well, right? Um, you know, some people are, I mean, I'll just use language, for instance, this can be a big one. Some people are happy or are okay with, you know, using, you know, curse language around children. Others are just like, you know, or, you know, that's just not something they do. And so coming up, with figuring out, okay, what this looks like, and we're all in agreement, right, before we start, is gonna save a lot of headache. Um, uh, whether it's open to everyone or whether it's private, right? Is this a co-op that you kind of need to know someone who's already in there before you can get in here? Um, or is it just, hey, anyone can join, we'll hold interviews. Um, that can make a huge difference. Um, Decision-making, who makes the decision? Um, because parents will ultimately, especially if you're offering content or some sort of academic, parents will want, you know, potential input into what's being offered, especially if they're paying for it, right? Uh, communication. How will you communicate? Is everything on Facebook? Am I just getting text messages? Is there, is there a policy for if it snows, by when will I be contacted? By which method will I be contacted? Um, is it on email? Is there a website? Like, what does that look like? Uh, payment collection, which can be very sensitive, right? People with their money, um, having those fleshed out and even thinking about, okay, how am I going to collect this money? Um, in the past, when you're young and you're starting out, you know, you, you may not think, you just think, yeah, it's $50, it's going to be 50 bucks, you know, but when someone's giving you 20 this day and 10 that day and there's no real record keeping and you're trying to remember, wait, I know she stuck $20 in my hand, but did she give me the other, you know? <laughs> that sort of thing, or they're sending you Cash App and PayPal's and all of those takeout fees. And at the end of the year, you might get something from the IRS saying you got this much in PayPal and now you're responsible for taxes on all of that money <laughs> if you are not set up correctly. Ask me how I know. <laughs> me too. Me too. My husband got real attentive when we got that when we got that in the mail. Yeah. Well, I would say he was like, well, wait a second. You're not actually making any money from this co-op, but that money filters into an account that has my name on it. And so as far as the government looking at if the monthly dues are 250, imagine 250 from 25 people every month for a year. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars to the government saying you now owe taxes. They don't care. You say I had to pay teachers. <laughs> you owe it. Yes. Um, so that that will force you to start thinking about 501s or LLCs or something real quick. Um, yeah, so Amber, any of these really uh, sort of Actually, resonate? Or do you have a story in particular about any of these? Uh uh, honestly, all of them resonate. And <laughs> over time, I didn't do this in the beginning, but um, over time, I saw a need for each and every one of these to be addressed. And we kind of created like a handbook. And, you know, some of my friends in the group were like, Amber, nobody's going to read this when they come in. And I'm like, that's okay. They had to sign something saying that they read it because inevitably when something comes up, 
I want to be able to refer to page six, you know, paragraph three that it was in there. Um, because I'll, I'll say if I have to pick one, I'll say the values. Um, and that really needs to be established up front. And I'm thankful that, that you know, I kind of was trying to be all official with our mission statement and kind of our value statement from the beginning. And the idea is that when you first start, you really do want to attract like a lot of families, but there's a problem if you attract the wrong families, it will mm -hmm. cause you nothing but heart, heartbreak and, and frustration. Okay. <laughs> and I found that most of the time in our group where we've had friction and issues, it's been that the it's a perfectly fine family but their expectations and what we have to deliver it we're not matching um so for instance our group is what what i call inclusive meaning that uh you can come and you can be included we don't have like signed statement of faith and um things like that and some people don't want that some people want a group that's exclusively Christian that have all signed a statement of faith. Some people want a group that is, you know, you're never going to be mentioned at all that people even have a faith background and our group is neither. So um, we're kind of all independent contractors. I'll say we're free, free agents. Um, and we don't teach, you know, anything in particular to any of the children, but we're all kind of in it together. So that's important uh, to let people know up front what type of group that they're that you have so that they can self select if they're on board with that idea or not on board with that idea. Similar to what you mentioned earlier, like all of our children identify um, as black or black biracial, but all 100% of the parents are not, but they used to be. And so some parents had a problem with that. They're like, whoa, they show up and they're like, everybody in the room, not black. Um, and as we grew, you know, that was something else to, to talk about. And I had, you know, we had to talk about who we are as a group and that we're here primarily for the children first and then the parents secondarily and what was that going to look like and all that. So I definitely think um, spelling it out specifically and not wa wavering on who you really are because you don't want to kind of attract families without by not telling the whole truth about what they're going to be entering into. So I think err on the side of being very vocal about what you're looking for for the group so that parents can be honest with themselves and know what they're getting into. And it might be that the group is not for them. And I think that's good too. I have friends in this community who are not in my group because the group is not for them, but we still are friends. Yeah, I think, you know, 100% exactly what you said. Um, and, you know, I always say, um, something that I've, I've learned is to just as, as the leader of a space, trust your gut. <laughs> you know, we all have, vibe, you know, some people, are, you know, you might meet somebody having a bad day, right? But overall, when you get a sense of who people are, when people, I always when people show you who they are through their actions or their behaviors or, you know, their, their interactions, then, you know, think about what you're seeing and is this going to be a good fit for what it is you're trying to build, the type of community that you want around uh, the children. And so that's, you know, a, a really great example, right? If you're saying you're, if you have an unschooling philosophy, you know, you've got someone who's extremely like, are we gonna do an honor roll ceremony at the end of the year? Are we gonna do this? Are we gonna do that? And you're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> and that might not be a good fit, right? If yes. they're looking for, the expectations don't align. Um, thank you so much. And just in case you're wondering, these are all photos from our co-op, different things. Uh, this was a book talk we did with Eden Royce. You may have uh, heard of her book, which has just escaped my mind. <laughs> Do anyone know? Um, it's a uh, it's about uh, hoodoo uh, and plant science uh, and all those wonderful things. And I don't know why I can't think of the name of it. Uh, this was an African dance class they were taking, and then out here is um, uh, uh, herbalism class that the kids do. So. All right, I know we have a couple of questions, so I might just sort of, since we're about halfway uh, through, just um, look at one. Someone uh, said, how do you handle the community with the anxiety of COVID? Do you require masks? Uh, I can share with, with us, um, we do require masks. Uh, we were really hoping that we would not have to require masks in this fall. It was a struggle, um, but we have, medically fragile families. My own daughter has asthma and has lung disease. And so for me, <laughs> being the head of this co-op, <laughs> thinking about my own child who um, the year before COVID 
she's only eight, but she was in the hospital three times and on oxygen. Um, this is before COVID even hit. So, you know, for us, you know, we take lots of natural remedies to try to, you know, heal. But I'm also very sensitive to the fact that she gets sick pretty quickly. And so, yeah, math was mandatory um, for us. And we, we did struggle with that with some families who did not want to wear masks. Um, the kids all actually did pretty well. Um, I feel like they've just sort of grown up in an environment, unfortunately, where they're used to seeing it. Um, we don't mask outside, but we meet inside where we do mask, and we also crack windows <laughs> um, wherever we can. And we have lots of hand sanitizer. Um, so for us, yeah, for us, it just depends on the time and year. And in some ways, we're a bit reactionary to what's happening in our environment, like what's going on with COVID. Um, a little bit different. We're further south. So we're in Georgia. So for the first couple of years, we spent almost all of our time outdoors. And uh, for the and, you know, for the most part, we were not masked. Um, our families, individual families, have the opportunity to plan events. And if someone plans an event and wants people masked, then the event is masked. So some events change for, depending on who's planning it and where it is. Um, and then we wore masks with at a lot of field trips, museums and all that stuff, because they also required masks. So we follow absolutely whatever rules where we're going, spend a lot of time unmasked outdoors. Um, and I want to be honest, you know, like we had an indoor unmasked event for moms last year. For, it was a beautiful holiday party. It was one of the most beautiful events I've ever been to in my entire life um, because of the moms who planned it. It was top notch in every way, but it was a super spreader. And um, it was a holiday party. So it was before Christmas and we all missed Christmas with our families um, by being isolated in our rooms. And it didn't matter because by the time we realized it, we had gotten our whole family sick. And that was about 15 moms and brought down their husbands and all the kids. So it's nothing to really take lightly. Um, and I would say our group hasn't been as masked as other people, but we also did pay a price for it. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I'm so sorry, you guys, that, that happened. Yeah. Um, I will say that we've, we've sort of lightened up, um, you know, the summer, but I feel like there's another wave going through and people are kind of getting sick. So I don't, I don't know what the fall looks like. My hope is that we will not be, that is my hope, but we'll just kind of see what it looks like. Well, you um, said there, um, there's a comment that says it's a little difficult to hear you. So oh. I don't know if you bring your mic closer or if you... I don't know. Um, I'll just try to talk louder. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Amber, can you share a little bit about what the structure of your space looks like? Because we said co-ops can look a little differently. So what does the programming look like? What does the overall structure look like? So for our group, we are a support group and we meet, we don't have, okay, until this coming fall, we the last five and a half years, we haven't had a set day of the week that we meet. It's ad hoc. So there are multiple activities on the calendar every week, but everyone's not going to want to do every activity. It might be something that's only for little kids. We might have a middle schoolers only event. We might have a total family event. Most of our things are during the weekday, but when we want to really have something that our dads can get heavily involved in, we do do things on the weekend sometimes together. We have something on um, this weekend on Saturday, a big family annual family picnic. So um, we do field trips, park dates. Um, sometimes we go out of town together to different uh, cultural activities and relevant things in other cities and we'll get like a huge Airbnb or we'll get, you know, adjacent hotel rooms. Um, we do uh, mom's night out, mom's afternoon out, dad's night out uh, to bring the parents together. We have monthly parent trainings called parent schools. We do enrichment classes of all different types. You could bring in a beekeeper, an herbalist, a dance, an African dance class or a drumming class, uh, anything. Um, and, uh, we do hiking, we go camping together. Um, I just can't even think. So we're on activity number 96 right now. So by the end of the month, we will have done a hundred activities for this year. Um, again, every activity is not for every family, um, because a lot of them are, it's just based on your interest and anybody can plan something and then they send it to me and I put it on the calendar and then anybody can sign up on our calendar for any of the activities that fit their children. Now, that's how it has been, but we just launched. Um, registration starts tomorrow for a Thursday 
um, actual kind of more traditional co-op program. In addition to what we're we've already been doing, we'll keep all of that. But we're now have uh, from 10 to three on Thursdays, we'll be meeting at a space we rented uh, for enrichment classes and things like that. So um, I've been inspired by, by your group and some of the others to want to have that type of regular um, thing that people can put on their calendars and count on. Um, so we're all super, super excited about that. We have double Dutch planned, a double Dutch instructors coming in and a chess instructor and art and science, like fun science experiments. And I'm teaching some of the other moms are teaching things. Um, and it's just going to be, it's going to be ridiculously awesome. I'm really excited about it. Beautiful. So, so you guys, mostly the teachers, but you said you're doing a mix. So some of the parents are teaching, but you're also bringing in some people. Yeah, so we want to have a lot of classes with the parents to keep the price down. And because our parents are pretty awesome, over the years, we found that sometimes we've been disappointed when we've brought in instructors and we've paid a lot of money for people to come in and teach like one time classes to our kids. And we're often left like, yo, I could have done that plus some. And so we've started trying to look within first at the talent we have. So yes, some of the parents are teaching, um, but then there were some things that, um, you know, we have some local black owned businesses that are just super fly and we want to bring them in and let them interact with our kids too. Yes, community partnerships are so important. Um, our, and um, Amber, if you ever want, uh, you're, I'm welcome, happy to um, let you share your screen and pull up your, uh, if you have a website that you want to share, I'm going to share mine in a second and then we can flip to yours. Okay. Um, we um, offer two programs as well. And I'm just going to pull it up on the screen. And you guys can take a look. Um, we offer basically a formal co op. I call it two programs, one community. That's my new sling thingy there. I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. We'll go with that. Uh, and so on Mondays and Wednesdays, we offer a mix of classes for um, youth. Uh, kindergarten up through beginning this fall, 10th up to 10th grade. So this fall, we're going to add high school. Um, and that's because a number of our children have been progressing and getting older. And so now we finally have ninth and 10th graders. Um, but on Mondays, they take a mix of classes, cultural studies, capoeira, science, map making, weaving, book club, theater. And on Wednesdays, they take a mix of classes as well. We meet on Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 to 2, 15 roughly. We rent out a community um, center. Uh, we hire all of our teachers. Uh, we do have a few exceptions to that, mostly due to uh, COVID. Uh, like the center that we use is owned by the city, and so they have their own requirements about who can teach. And so if, if people weren't willing to meet those requirements, then we couldn't hire them. And so we had some parents who stepped up to do uh, some of those classes. And then we also have, uh, much like how yours is, Amber, although I don't think we're as active. I don't think we've had 100 activities. But <laughs> We have something called Friends of the Co-op. Uh, what I'll say is the formal co-op is uh, traditionally for children of color, right? Friends of the co-op, anyone can join us. Um, and this is basically field trips, play dates, uh, workshops, activities. Um, these are people who uh, traditionally maybe they aren't able to commit to two days a week. One thing to think about when you build your space is, are you going to require parents to be on site? Um, and that makes a huge, huge difference. It makes a difference on the level of interconnectedness that you um, have as well. Uh, my personal thought, and we are um, parents must be on site or an adult or someone. Uh, we do have some children who come with other families. And so that family adult is their person as well. So we're, we are somewhat flexible. Um, and since we don't uh, teach, we hire teachers, a lot of people say, well, what exactly are, are we doing? Like, we have to be there and we're not teaching. <laughs> well, um, our hope is that we build connections, right? It's a place for us to get together and do a yoga class or go walking on the trails or come together and plan for, all right, what are you using for this? What are you using? Let me see your, you know, what are you guys taking? Are you doing swimming? Oh, we want to do swimming. Oh, you know, so we just kind of come together and really it's a time for us to bond. Um, prior to COVID, we were, um, you know, doing a lot of workshops, like we would um, have workshops just for us um, mothers and fathers, because we do have some fathers who are active um, as the homeschooling parent. Um, and so we just use that time, right? Now, we do ask a parent to float around in each of the classes um, 
we have about uh, 50 children. They are broken into different groups just to let you know organizational, instructional wise. So we have a K through two group. We have a three through five group. We have a middle school unit. And then we have a new ninth and 10th grade with the hope that over the years we'll, have, we'll add 11 and 12. Um, and each of those groups have their own set of classes that they uh, get to attend. Um, and so what we would, we'll say is, all right, um, our youngest group, lower elementary K through two, they didn't like being called the little kids. They called themselves the cool kids. And so we'll say, can we get a mama to be the floater for the cool kids, right? Um, and so that's when they've got to go to the bathroom, when a, a tooth falls out, when, you know, <laughs> I don't know. And they're having a hard time. They're hungry. They just need a snack, you know. It's good to have somebody on site to sort of jump in, especially when they're younger. Now, the older kids, the middle schoolers, we were following them around. And then around March, uh, we were just like, you guys are good. You know, they sort of navigate and they all go to the same classes. So it's a beautiful little pod, if you want to call it, of about 12 middle schoolers that um, travel together and go to different classes. And we see them in the hallways and they're super lovely and helpful. Um, and then um, you mentioned partners, and that was, if I go back to my near part, I wanted to talk a little bit about community partners, because this is something that I feel like co-ops don't utilize, that exist, that are really wonderful. Uh, Amber, you are famil familiar with Vila, yeah? Yes, we, we, that's how we were able to launch our Thursday program. Okay. So yeah, Amber and I are both grant recipients of an organization called Vila, whose mission is basically to help fund um, people who want to create, uh, what would you say? Alternatives um, to yeah. traditional school. Alternatives to traditional school. Um, I've, we've received $10,000 grants. The application process is extremely simple. Um, and we were able to use that grant to uh, help basically offset some of the call uh, or a lot of the costs, right yes. and to bring in programming um uh but another uh, so i would ask everyone to check that out it's v-e-l-a and um we'll get it sent out to you um now what i will say about vila is that uh you know one thing i didn't know and i'm saying it's because of our faith um was who some of the backers are financially right so here's what i'll say um it really hurts my heart that sometimes we have to resort <laughs> to funding from people who i think don't always align with our values and we may not know that until after we've already done done that deal and that was my case right i didn't know who they were until after we had already been awarded this grant and I'm not saying these are like the devil or anything, but what I will say is that my personal stance on like public education, I am not trying to close all the public schools. I am not anti-school. Yeah, I was a school teacher. Um, and so that's just not where I am. I'm not saying all the folks behind Vila are, but you know, there's a reason why folks are investing in these communities to take place and not investing in say our public schools. Right. So there's 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 something to think about there, right? Um, when you reach out to community partners and trying to make sure that you are in alignment. Amber, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Uh, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the folks have been great. They haven't asked us for, asked me for anything no. in return. Um, they haven't been, can I send people to take pictures of your babies? Uh, can we, you know, there hasn't been anything. Nothing. Um, and it's been, for us, it's been uh, over two years now. So, um, I'm assuming anything that would have been coming would have come by now. But other people that we partner with, um, you know, you'll just see companies out there. And what I would say is, even if you're not a legal entity, we are in the process now of becoming a 501. We have not been all of these years. We've been um, happily trying to float under a radar, but I would not suggest that for um, a large group for the tax purposes that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so reaching out to different companies. So we um, had lunch donated to all of our kids every Monday this year through a local nonprofit uh, food truck who brought us burritos and stuff, you know, and it was all like vegetarian and it was all picked from like local farmers gardens. Um, and that was just a simple ask, right? These companies, and I'm just let you know, these nonprofits often 
um, large white led nonprofits, they get grants a lot of times, and you all know this, to serve black and brown communities, right? And they cherry pick a lot of times who they want to serve. Um, as soon as I see an organization that I think is somewhat decent, and they're talking about they've got a grant to do work with, you know, XYZ, I'm the first one sending emails saying, okay, I'm going to call y'all on this. Here's what I need. Here's what I, here's how many children I have. Here's what we would like. You say you're about this. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> and then either they respond or they don't. Right. Uh, and it's not, and I really don't, I don't, I say that the way I say it now, because I really don't take like a threatening, you know, approach. But what I'm saying is don't be afraid to ask for whatever it is you need um, from whoever it is that has access or resources that would benefit your children um, and put your own things with it. You know, so I say, hey, we want this, but you know, you're not going to number one, get any pictures with us. You know, don't think you're going to come here donating stuff to, to, to this children. I think you're going to plaster. You're like, you have to, if you're going to give, you're giving on my terms. Um, and if we want to thank you later, we will. <laughs> if we don't, you know, it may be private, you know, it may not be public, and you're going to be okay with that too. Uh, we partner with Capital One. They have a series of cafes where we are. And so they've done a number of parties for us, movie parties, um, holiday parties. Um, where they, they just, they've got these connections that you can't even dream, and budgets that we can't even dream of. Um, you know, Crayola. Uh, I think this last one down here is actually not a picture for a month. It may be, but we also do a lot of... Um, social justice work, or at least we did prior to COVID. Um, and so we would have the kids engage. Next year, we're doing a civics class in which the kids will be at the General Assembly uh, talking to lawmakers um, or protesting, depending on which, which way we go. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Okay, we have some questions in the box oh, for us. Okay. One says, are you all using a special nature-based philosophy like Charlotte Mason? Um, mm. And no, my group is literally a group of free agents. So I personally do a lot of work in that, in that area, uh, just for my business, but, and to, to be honest, I bet you half of the families and heritage homeschoolers have never even heard of Sean Mason and wouldn't care if I try to tell them about it. Um, so I, I, that's totally separate. Like these are my local people. These are like my family reunion. And then I do public work in that Charlotte Mason space. So my group is not affiliated with any, any philosophy. Um, we are also not affiliated with any um, philosophy. We do uh, read up and we're thinking about applying for, uh, there's a four school certification that you can get um, there is some Montessori nature work that I um, really love and is really beautiful uh, with regards to some of the um, tools that they use in which to teach about botany uh, that are, you know, um, uh, Montessori based and uh, probably, uh, what do you call, licensed <laughs> Montessori materials. But no, what we do is we figure out where the children are interested and then we try to go out in the community and find people who uh, are melanated who can come in and share their gifts. So I'm sharing now our uh, Instagram feed. And so you'll see currently we're doing um, this microgreens, right? Growing with microgreens. And this is a gentleman who runs a local microgreens company. So he comes and he's doing a workshop uh, to teach the kids about that. And so um, here we did a book uh, study on a book by the name of Free Water. We met the author. Um, here's one of our teachers teaching the book study. And you can see we're outside and we're not masked. <laughs> we're outdoors. Uh, some people are, just depends on what your choices are. Indoors, we typically are. Um, and then we met with the author, right? Um, there we are. There are the children. But then we took a trip to the Great Dismal Swamp, right? And we met with this gentleman here. His name, he's related to a gentleman by the name of Moses Granby, whose ancestor um, actually had an autobiography published. Um, by um, uh, uh, abolitionist company way back in the day, and his stories are still um, here. And so um, this is really how we try to infuse nature. And on this nature, we're looking at plants. We are identifying herbs that were listed in the, in the book. Um, we make a number. We have an herbalist, and so the children make a lot of um, medicine. We have raised beds. 
um, that the children are responsible for. We tie in lots of books and stories. Here's Earth Mother. Um, I think they're doing some activities there. Uh, we tend to tie just a lot of outdoor time. Um, you know, here is, uh, I think this is a, I'm not sure why, okay. But you can, I'm gonna let that play for a second. I think the kids were let off trail in the forest and they were given a compass and a map and they were basically told to find something. Uh, and if they found it, they got a, a reward at the end. Um, but they had to work together as a group to, uh, is a little waterfall where we're located to, um, to find uh, the final thing. And this came after a year of, oops, sorry, let me get out of here, a year of uh, oratoring study. And so we really try to tie nature into everything that we do, um, as well as um, emphasizing the cultural diversities and how people engage in nature. So I think uh, if you want to you know, feel free to go look at this um, Instagram, you'll see pretty clearly how we use nature all around us to engage. Mm -hmm. So there was another question asking um, how far, they're, they're specifically asking you, how far do your families come from in your group? Um, I think the furthest is about 45 minutes. Okay, um, our furthest is like an hour. And so uh, you don't have to be in our county to be in the group, but they just have to understand that our activities are here, but if they're willing to travel in, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you set up co-ops, do you have to have waivers or extra insurance in place? We have insurance mm -hmm. um, because we rent a facility and um, I don't want to be liable <laughs> mm -hmm. for anyone hurting themselves. Even though the facility has insurance, our group uh, does have insurance. Now, what I will say is we didn't always have insurance. It's actually only fairly recently that we decided to do that after we grew our first couple of years with just like 12 families. We didn't. Um, when we got to like 50 kids, now we're like, okay, um, there's a much higher chance that someone might hurt themselves because there's so many kids running around. Um, or even just out in the community, right? If you're out in the group and somebody accidentally knocks over some vase because we're at the museum, potentially your group could be held responsible for that. Yes, and same with us. We did not have insurance, but because we're now renting facil a facility, we also have insurance. Or getting interns. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Do you still want me to share my screen or? Yes, please. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, so this is our website. Um, this is what our parents see when they log in. This is what the public sees too, but I already logged in before I switched over here. So when they're logged in, um, Oh, it logged me out. I took too long. So when they're logged in, they have access to our calendar up here. And in our calendar, they can just log in and you can see all these different things that will pop up. This is summer is kind of like our off times, but we're just kind of doing fun things here and there. So let's say somebody wants to look and find out more about this beach day. They would click on the beach day. There'll be a little picture, who's hosting it, where it's going to be, how much. They can click on these tabs up here and add it to their calendar. And if this was an event that charged money, they would be able to pay. So let's see. This is our picnic on Saturday. This one, um, you can't tell because I'm already logged. I already signed up for it. But there'll be a place where you can sign up for it and pay if there is a charge. Um, so that's kind of how our group runs. We also have a... Um, we have a, a Facebook group, but we post pictures on our Facebook group of uh, our kids and everything. And so it's a private group that only our members can see. Um, so when they log in to our Facebook group, they can um, look up all different types of things. This was just like a reminder about book club and we post pictures after all of our events. Um, and uh, that other thing I would share just quickly, I know we're running low on time, is about our book club. And I know you guys have one of those too. This is one of our most popular events or activities and we've had it for many years. And I can just share just quickly how we set it up. 
So we have these six groups and they meet simultaneously because most of our families have kids that would be in more than one group. Mm -hmm. um, and we have met, we used to meet for years. We met outside at a park. So if it rained, I guess we would get wet or we would reschedule book club or whatever. But um, then for COVID, we were doing book club completely on Zoom. And now book club will be part of our, it's monthly, but it'll be part of our Thursday group. So um, the children have read all, to, you know, collect Collectively over the years, hundreds and hundreds of books by people, by and about people of color. And one thing I want to mention, because a lot of people may assume that um, all of our families are really culturally conscious. And um, I know mm. that when you guys first got together, I saw you guys meeting together and all that and coming up with that. So maybe people were more like-minded. That isn't necessarily the case in my group. Um, often there are kids who have told me that Miss Amber, I love this so much. I've never read a book with a black person in it. Um, and so I consider that book club to be a critical turning point for a lot of our families to be able to see the type of literature that can be like really life-giving for their families and children. So don't assume that just because your families are black or brown and they're joining that they are conscious about the types of materials and resources they're putting before their kids. Yeah, that is such a good point. And also just to plug, um, if you guys haven't been to, um, okay, what's the actual business place where they can find all your beautiful like lessons and, and things? Yeah, heritagemom.com. Heritage Mom, please go check that out, heritagemom.com. Um, and your new book. <laughs> Yeah, so I, didn't even, I didn't even really think about that, but let's see, there's a question. What books are you reading in your book club? Yes, on heritagemom.com, there is a uh, list, an ongoing list from the very beginning, from the first year of the book club. And it has all of our, um, it has all of our, yeah, our books in it that we've read or that we continue to read and I keep it updated. So um, that's it. And I just launched a book. It's called A Place to Belong. Um, and it's basically about a lot of the things that we're talking about here, but I actually documented what it looks like to give a child this type of a life. And if that's something that you're, you know, interested in learning more about, I mean, it goes way, way deeper than we could ever have time for today on the call, um, chapter by chapter. And, um, it can be, you can find it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. It's beautiful. And Amber, we made the decision, well, I've made the decision that because we have families that are multiracial, that it's going to be a required reading for anyone who are not both black parents. <laughs> That's beautiful. Before I love that. It's it's my ears. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, because you find that as well, right? When you start looking, you think, oh, well, they're, you know, we got black children, so we're kind of in alignment. Not always, you know. No. I mean, That's a whole conversation on co-ops. Uh, <laughs> yes. Part two. I hope, yeah. I hope this has been really helpful, everyone. Please don't hesitate. I'm sure I can speak for Amber as well to, to either of us. All of our social media handles are, are in the chat. I am Cultural Roots Homeschool. Um, and you can find me, Mighty Networks. You can join our Patreon where you'll get access to also our calendar, but also uh, webinars that we do to support parents. Um, and so we have a number of classes in which, or, or workshops from, you know, like Nicole, the math lady who came on recently to talk about how do you teach math to your kids? Because, you know, even though you're building a co-op, we still are responsible for our children's education. And sometimes we need a little professional development as well. <laughs> so don't hesitate to reach out to me personally or uh, Instagram, Facebook, any of those things. That's great. Thank you for bringing me on. I'm looking up, I'm putting our, our, our stuff back in the chat. A couple of people dropped out and then they can't have, they can't access it anymore. So thank you guys so much for being here. We're available for questions. I really enjoyed it. And I hope some of you are motivated to just get something started in your community and you can start small. It might only be a book club or only just a field trip group or only just a hiking group, but none of those are really only. Those are all huge opportunities. Um, for, you know, your, your family to build community. So thank you. Thank you for joining me, Amber. I appreciate it. Thank you.